would like my panelists to introduce themselves and the pronouns if they would so choose to do that. Hi, I'm Holden. He is him. Hi, I'm Randolph. He is him. I'm Robert. I'm Robert. Um, I will now go through and just make sure we have everyone in the right positions and they're in the room they should be. Also your team name and then after that please tell me who is speaking in what order and if you would like to disclose a pronoun, this is your opportunity to do so. If a pronoun is not disclosed, I would ask debaters defer back to gender neutral terms or speaker positions. Opening government, UBC RWBB. Uh, Reese, masculine pronoun speaking first. Opening opposition, UPS PUCB. Um, UAA, RHJM, closing up. John speaking first, no preference. Robert speaking second, no preference. Speaker titles, please. Closing opposition, Claremont, HOGS. Uh, Marcus speaking first, he and his. So it's under Glenn Scahill, but I'm, okay. I'm filling in. Sorry, I was like, yeah. oh no. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm Helena Ong speaking second, she okay. first. Yeah. Thank you. Hold in, we'll be giving you time signals. There will be a slap at one, a slap at six, two. Oh, clap is fine. There'll be one, six, seven. At 7.15, you will get the slow clap of shame until you stop talking and sit down. Okay, uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite the Prime Minister to open up this round. Here, here. since 1977 when the dual mandate was introduced. We think the economy in particular has changed to a significant degree. We think the problems that face the US economy, the issues that the Federal Reserve looks at, and the things that affect everyday American life are very different than when the dual mandate was introduced. Okay, first, like, simple uh, model for this round. We just think that like Congress is going to revoke the dual mandate. We think it gives more autonomy to the Fed to pursue things that they want to do. I'm going to talk about why the dual mandate is bad. I don't necessarily have like a like uh, a co comprehensive plan for exactly what the Fed should do because like I'm not a federal banker. But we think we like take away this mandate that hangs over their shoulders, give them more ability to adapt to the U.S. market, give them more ability to adapt to the economy. Okay. We think that in 1977, America was racked by incredibly <coughs> high rates of inflation. We think when inflation too, gets too high, it, uh, you, you, like, it fundamentally hurts the economy, especially when it exceeds economic growth, right? 1977 was the period of like Jimmy Carter's stagflation, right? Where you had low economic growth, anti-inflation, like something not thought possible except in wars, but like Jimmy Carter found a way. Okay, we think that in 1977, or 1979 rather, Paul Hor Paul Volcker was like appointed to the Federal Reserve. We think he tackled in inflation in particular, although this had like a short-term hurt on economic growth. What it did do is it crippled inflation. We think federal chairman and like the idea of Congress and the dual mandate has been like based off this Paul Volcker model consistently. We think they like they worship Paul Volcker because he killed inflation. But we think the problems that Volcker faced in 1979 are very different than the problems we have today. We don't think inflation is an inherent bad, as I'm going to talk about today. Second, how does the Federal Reserve actually, uh, like, how does it affect inflation? The way they do it is by lowering or, like, increasing uh, in interest rates on the loans they give, right? High interest rates mean that you are less likely to take out loans. It means that there is going to be less growth, but inherently there is going to be less inflation, right? Like, that's what Paul Volcker did in 1979 and 1981. He jacked inflation rates way up, it hurt economic growth, but it killed inflation, right? Alternatively, if you put very low interest rates in, we think that it means there's more lending and, and you have like higher inflation and more economic growth, okay? We think that's like the fun, no thank you, that's the way they affect the market. We think in recent times though, this metric has been less effective. And there's like a significant reason for this. It's because the US economy is changing and becoming more centralized among a few certain companies. Not only because of the emergence of new like monopoly and multinational corporations like Amazon, but also because of mergers between major corporations. This means that the Federal Reserve has less control over lending rates, no thank you, because like 
Amazon doesn't, or like these huge companies don't necessarily, like they already have the capital, so they're less reliant on loans, which means the Federal Reserve has less effect on that. We think that the U.S. has actually failed to meet its target inflation rate for multiple years. We think that other developed countries like Japan have actually had consistent deflation over the past decade. That's problematic. That's the world we exist in today. No, thank you. That's the world that the Federal Reserve needs to address. That's the world that the dual mandate is preventing us from addressing. Okay, next, I'm going to actually, I'll take back half. Yeah. Can you explain how the interest rates in the U.S. have been at a record low for a record period of time, and yet your inflation has not happened, and inflation has not happened? Okay, as I've talked about, they lack the ability to influence inflation through like the central means because more of the economy is centralized on these major corporations because these corporations don't take out as many government loans or take out as many bank loans because they have centralized capital in the first place. We think that like this is a changing situation in the economy that like, you have, the Federal Reserve has to address. They have to find out new ways. We think the dual mandate is inefficient in dealing with this new economy. We think that like, that's problematic. That's something that you have to address. Okay, why are like, both targets of the dual mandate, both low inflation and uh, full employment, bad? Like, okay, inflation first. We think that like, inflation rates need to match the rate of growth. Right? We think that like countries like Japan that actually have deflation, or even countries like the U.S. where the inflation has not reached the levels that is supposed, or like has not reached its target inflation levels, are like problematic because you create a situation where banks and like creditors are less likely to lend money. That's just like inherently how inflation works, right? If you take a, like a thousand dollar loan and you're and like there's inflation and suddenly that thousand dollars is worth a lot more, but you still only have to pay back the thousand dollars, like. In, in, in reality, you're paying back less money than you owe. Alternatively, deflation, right, you, like, it works in reverse, right? So when you have deflation, so like inflation is good in, in certain respects as long as it matches economic growth. But when you have too low inflation that doesn't match economic growth, when you have deflation like Japan, it means that creditors are very unwilling to loan money. This is problematic for e the economy because like if you want to start a business, if you're not one of these huge multinational corporations that have tons of capital in the first place, you're unlikely to get a loan because the, the bank is unlikely to give it to you. Like, I know we all hate banks, right? But like, banks are important for economic growth. We think that some, like, when you have, don't have inflation rates that actually benefit creditors, you have economic problems. We think the Federal Reserve needs to address that. No, thank you. We think the dual mandate doesn't allow them to. Secondly, full employment. We think like a hypothetical market with full employment is actually problematic. We think a good employment rate is around like 3% per se, because when you have like full employment, hypothetically, it means you utterly lack labor fluidity, right? Because you can't fire anybody because there's no one to hire. And you can't leave your job to get a better one because there is no better job, because there's no labor market, right? You need a pool, no thank you, that people can dip into and dip out of. That's how economies function. When you have absolutely no unemployment, it means that the labor market is completely stagnant because you can't, one, expand your company, let's say, because there's no one to hire, but two, you can't, like, yeah, you can't, Create, like increase investment, you can't like create new business opportunities because there's no labor market to do it. We think that's problematic. And like I said, it actually hurts labor mobility for individuals, not just corporations, because when you want to leave your job, we think right on, like when there's like low unemployment, like 3% or something, you can dip out of the unemployment market. You will not be there very long. You can move into a different position. We think that's actually good. Like the economy needs people to be unemployed for like short periods of time. Obviously, when you hit high unemployment, that's where you get problems. When you have people un unemployed for multiple years on end, that's problematic. We think what we aim for is like an unemployment rate under five percent. We think full unemployment is actually hugely problematic. It utterly stagnates the economy in the same way that inflation targets and that don't match the rate of growth and inflation or like and deflation utterly stagnate the economy because it makes creditors unwilling to lend money because they're not going to get their investment back, right? We think that's hugely problematic. Ladies and gentlemen, we think the Federal Reserve is tied to an archaic system that doesn't address the new world. It doesn't address the new economy. We think the Federal Reserve needs to be flexible in its ability to deal with new crisis. We think the Federal Reserve needs to be flexible in the way that it addresses the, the problems of inflation and full employment. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Like to thank the Prime Minister, Head of Leader of Opposition, to open up the op bench. Here, here. <clears throat> okay, 
so I'll be opening up my speech with some brief refutation, or yeah, with some brief analysis of the Prime Minister's speech, and then going into several disadvantages to the plan proposed. So first, the idea that raising interest rates is a counter somehow to the centralization of wealth or a response to the changes in the United States economy actually is the reverse because increases in interest rates make, make it so that wealth is less accessible for the majority of people. Loans are less accessible for the majority of people. The way that the Federal Reserve controls interest rates means that people would be less able, the more people would be, have less access to capital if interest rates were increased to stop inflation as the um, affirmative team proposes. This is part of the utility of this curve. But going then on to the main points of uh, positive matter, we can see that there are several independent disadvantages to the plan, which was not really a plan in as much as a proposal for just simple abolition. There was no sort of alternative provided. But the uh, first of all, there's the main point, which is investor confidence. Uh, the, this, um, this curve has been a constant point of United States policy since 1977. It is accepted widely as a principle of um, United States, as, yes? Okay, in my speech I told you that full unemployment is not good, and I told you that like fighting inflation is not beneficial for the U.S. right now. We, we, the dual mandate makes the Federal Reserve try to do both. By removing it, how is that problematic? Sure. Removing it is problematic because this dual mandate is accepted by the reason why it stayed in place and why it was proposed in the first place is because it's accepted by a wide range, first accepted by a wide range of economists as economic principle, accepted as economic doctrine. Second, it shows to the public that the United States federal government is invested in fighting what is perceived as economic ills on multiple fronts. So removing it is uh, shakes that perception in and confidence in the United States government, in the United States government policy, and would result in massive sell-offs. This ultimately, as stock markets themselves are an indicator of, gov of economic health in the eyes of many, leads, uh, leads to layoffs, etc., and leads to a general decline in economic health. Um, yes? Okay, so how can the Federal Reserve be perceived as helping the economy during downturns if the mandate prevents them from doing the expansionary policy that might increase inflation, but actually allows people to get credit and get jobs? The Federal Reserve, the way that it is structured right now, allows it to appease as many sides as possible and maintain confidence by maintaining the status quo. The, People don't want the boat to be rocked, in essence, whereas your radical change and radical divergence from policy would ultimately mean that the confidence in the United States government would be shaken. Um, and second point is that without the confines of a specific policy to operate within, it makes it harder to regulate capital accumulation, and capital accumulation would just accelerate. So the Federal Reserve has this specific policy guideline um, but without a, this specific policy guideline, the main goal of the Federal Reserve becomes facilitating the increase of profit. This is the, this can be seen by how interest rates, as I laid out earlier, would operate. And would, without specific clear policy guidelines, there's no guarantee that the central bank does not just become another bank. Um, and finally, with this, there's the fact that this leads to an increase in the power of the government overall, specific, which is uniquely bad with our current government, with Trump in power, the, with the capacity to just, as they said with Congress, just sort of wipe away um, what is considered long-standing precedent, long-standing doctrine, um, without taking into account the fact that people believe this to be settled precedent, um, gives um, and it gives ultimately an established sets of precedent that wiping away um, uh, established doctrines is something that uh, that this that this administration or this Congress can do. This 
can be transferred to other policies. This also feeds into the narrative of policy victories for Trump, where Trump can just tout something that has been accomplished under him as a policy victory. Um, this retrenches structural violence that is ongoing under this administration. The fact that Trump can use his capacity to oh, erase other norms, or this Congress can use the capacity to erase other norms um, in order to further the goal of structural violence. Um, yes? Yeah, so saying that Trump exists is not an argument, right? You have to tell me why Trump would specifically weaponize the Federal Reserve, assuming he understands how these mechanisms work any more than we do in this debate, and cause harm to the economy. How specifically does that happen? Okay, so here's my next point. So Trump uh, would ultimately be able to use these wide standing principles in his ongoing trade war, his ability to wipe away um, economic sort of precedent and just ignore it is would lead to disastrous consequences in this trade war. The fact that he would be able to change Federal Reserve policy on a whim, the fact that there, he would be able to tout that previous victories in this arena would ultimately lend credence to these narratives that he's doing the right thing with the trade war and would ultimately lend further firepower to him in this arena. This further weakens and destroys the free trade system, which has disastrous consequences for not just the United States economy, which has already seen job losses because of the trade war, but has disastrous consequences for the world economy as the just free trade network becomes more and more bifurcated. And so because of the fact that uh, as we laid out, as I laid out the, criti the criticisms of sort of the, how interest rates would function and would become just another tool to prevent pe regular people from accumulating capital, but also these independent disadvantages of the decrease in investor confidence leading to recession, um, the fact that the Fed would no longer be restrained by specific policies, and the fact that Trump could use this erasure of precedent to erase further precedents in the future, especially in his trade war, I am proud to oppose. I would like to thank the Leader of Opposition and the Deputy Prime Minister to close out the top half of the government bench. You're here. Here, here. Okay, so on OG, I just want to clarify a couple of things. We are act, we are we we assume that the Fed is an independent organization, like with no political aims whatsoever. So the points about for the Trump trade war and using and the ability of the Fed to be weaponized, we're assuming on our side of the house that the Fed is a non-political organization with the goal of keeping a relatively stable monetary policy. So that's the that's the setting we are going to go off of on OG. But first of all, to address um, OO's concerns about investor confidence, actual investors understand that the Fed takes um, that the Fed takes steps that might not be completely in line with um, with a rapid expansion and growth. So we won't be uh, concerned that investors will um, will have flight because they understand that the Fed does not always um, try to appease the status quo all the time. So furthermore, um, in terms of uh, regulating capital accumulation and um, facilitating increases of profit, um, on our side of the house, we think that the, that's not really a big deal and that, the, um, that currently the, uh, the Fed is working effectively. Yes, sorry. You said that the Fed is a non-political entity, which is true, but your partner said that Congress would specifically remove this, so how precisely does the Fed operate then? Um, so the Fed, yeah, the Fed is an independent board of directors and everything like that, of course, but um, we're saying that, we're, we're just saying that we're not um, assuming the Fed is like a weaponized organization and that it's unchained from Congress and the legislative branch, so that's just like the model we're going to go off of on this side. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're just assuming that investor confidence will not be affected and that um, the Trump, because actual invest, yeah, actual investors um, understand that the Fed's not always going to take the most pro-growth perspective. And also, we think that the Trump trade war is not really warranted, is not really a, um, a point of importance because we see it as a, an organization that's 
I usually untainted by politics. So to get back to what Reese said and just reiterate our case, uh, first we said that uh, that full employment has a lot of detriments. So like, we need labor fluidity because especially with the recent expansion of jobs in um, non-conventional markets and freelance work, etc., we want uh, people to have the ability to um, to not be under the constraints of normal um, labor practices. So we're saying that on our side of the house that um, expansion is prevented by having a goal of full employment at all. Because we're, because we obviously, as we said, we need um, more of a labor market and um, we, need, uh, we need people who actually can fill, fill jobs and are able to leave the jobs that they um, have had previously. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're saying that uh, full employment has a lot of uh, issues that are not really addressed by uh, by OO, and having that as a goal of full employment will um, will keep people res con uh, constrained within jobs where they otherwise could expand if there were open slots available. And furthermore, on our side of the house as well, we um, we respect the we um, have the, we have the idea that it's better to create less but better jobs than just a rapid expansion to create low wage jobs in a race to the bottom. So. The idea, yeah, uh, uh, the idea of full employment and keeping the um, the unemployment rate above three percent is essential on our side of the house, and um, yeah, that's why we disagree with the uh, dual mandate. And then, furthermore, um, and, yeah, in terms of inflation, like Reese said, uh, we just have points of def um, Japan with points of deflation has um, not had, has not led to any economic growth, and. Um, yeah, they haven't had the expansion that companies in like the United States have had, and um, yeah, we need to match growth. And um, yeah, in terms of loans, yeah, we, we believe that um, that it is better to have the uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we believe that uh, we want the uh, we do we don't want to always pursue the uh, low inflation rate because it leads to um, indiscretionary spending and um, creates uh, situations like the uh, housing uh, issue in 2008 did. Yeah. Yeah, so you say that, um, that some unemployment is good and that we should have fewer, better jobs. What about the people who can't feed their families because they don't have jobs? How does um, your policy address that? Well, no, all we're saying on our side of the house is that there's always, there always needs to be a uh, an unemployment rate in a country because that's just how the economy functions by having the ability for people to be mobile and move from job to job. Companies have slots. It's like you don't have, if you have a zero unemploy, empl um, unemployment rate, then um, you won't have any ability to, uh, you have no ability to hire workers or for people to move around or whatever. So we just believe in our sort of house that um, we have more of the perspective of growth. So. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So a hypothetical market with full employment means that uh, you lack labor fluidity, and um, you can't fire people because the labor market doesn't exist. And we uh, we just think that it'd be better to have a more um, open labor market. Yeah. So this dual, dual mandate has been in place for fifty years. Have we ever actually uh, got zero unemployment in the fifty years? No, but um, there are states in the um, in the U.S. where unemployment is reaching really critically low levels, and states like Maine, for example, really struggle to find laborers that to work, especially like low skilled jobs, because the unemployment rate is just so low. So overall, yeah, Reese and I um, have given you that a full full employment is bad. We don't want to reach the point of uh, deflation like Japan has had. We want to. Um, increase investment opportunities, and uh, retain the Fed as a non-political institution. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Deputy Prime Minister and the Deputy Leader of Opposition to close out the top half of this debate here. Excuse me.
Okay, so I'm going to start off with some refutations and then go on and kind of like extend and expand upon some of the points my partner made, which I think bring an excellent analysis into this debate. Uh, excellent analysis into this debate. So to begin with, I want to I want to address the primary claims that they are addressing in their case, which is that low that low that low unemployment is bad and that high interest rates are better because in uh, are better because in it increases inflation, um, um, which ultimately should, in their theoretical orientation, um, lead, to, uh, lead, uh, lead to a little bit more um, um, investment um, overall, uh, but specifically by more like uh, well thought out investment, investment that they decide, uh, investment that isn't um, a bad decision investing, which they imply in their last speech. So, Basically, um, we're going to say that this assumption that low unemployment is that, that zero unemployment is even an achievable feat is pretty much like not very much empirically backed up. It might be supported in some particular localities, but we would say that that is a temporary measure, and we would also say that the Federal Reserve being completely freed of a mandate probably wouldn't uh, probably wouldn't fix that because at that point, when they're freed of a mandate, there's literally no predicting what they will do. There is no policy guiding what the Federal Reserve does aside from the fact, aside from the. The individual orientation of the head of the Fed. Yeah. No, the mandate guiding what the Federal Reserve would do is what the bankers on the Federal Committee could do, not the like random people who were in Congress in 1977 still dictating economic policy. Right. Okay. So let's talk about this 1977 policy. Specifically, I want to talk about the impact of high employment, uh, uh, of low unemployment. They talk about this uh, low unemployment in terms of macroeconomic trends and specifically the impact that macroeconomic trends have. I'm going to talk to you uh, specifically about how it affects people because I think how we should evaluate how government institutions perform is in the lens of people, not in the lens of macroeconomic policy. For one thing, I think that the la I think that um, I think that the idea that we should, uh, uh, I think that the idea that unemployment isn't high enough is um, a statement that indicates that the orientation specifically, okay, so on our, um, the first point that my partner makes is uh, about um, how increasing interest rates, um, uh, how increasing interest rates would ultimately actually uh, be bad, uh, would be bad for investor confidence, specifically that investor confidence. Um, this has been a long-term policy. It has set a precedent in the Federal Reserve. This is what investors expect. It leads to them having an expectation of stability in the market. Investors crave stability because they don't want their money disappearing up in smoke. That stability is something that they feel is critical to maintain. When the vast majority of investors are not investing in like risky kind of uh, risky stocks, they're investing to maintain their money in a way that's more profitable to them than putting it away. Um, when you remove a long-standing policy, regardless of the economic impact that that policy has, it leads to the perception among investors that there is instability within that institution, that they can't predict what that institution is going to do, and therefore they can't predict how the economy will behave. That predictability is uh, is absolutely key, and specifically impacts the growth of the economy overall. Um, uh, the um, the uh, next point my uh, the next point my par uh, my partner makes is the remove uh, is removing the confines of how the Federal Reserve behaves, which we just took a PO uh, which I just took a POI addressing specifically that POI addressed how it would use the particular um, it would use the particular decisions made by the board. The board is made up of individuals. Those individuals should make choices about their theoretical orientation towards the economy. Those individuals, uh, by and large, subscribe to like liberal economic policies. They specifically are dealing with institutionalized economic policies. Those institutionalized economic policies specifically tend towards seeing uh, the rising tide carries all ships, basically. Um, that rising tide carries all, uh, base, uh, carries all ship logic uh, leads to an accumulation of capital in precisely what they identify, that capital is held in the hands of a few, small, uh, of a few institutions rather than spread out by and large. The increase in interest rates will mean that even less people can invest in the economy, uh, economy writ large and that even more that's going to be particular large corporations with power to do that investment. The removal of the confines on the market means that the US, the US Federal Reserve can specifically facilitate the economic expansion and increase the profits of those corporations. Many members uh, of the Federal Reserve have like close industry ties, they have, have substantial economic benefits. These are not people who are living uh, day to day, pay paycheck to paycheck, which means that they are not anticipating those people's needs. They're thinking within a framework that doesn't anticipate 
that particular thing, lower house. Well, I think the lack of investor confidence is extremely short term, at which point they're going to be predicting what kind of decisions the board are going to be making over time as they adjust their expectations. The difference on our side of the house is that they get to be flexible during, during times of economic crises or international yeah. currency crises, which they are currently hamstring from preventing as it stands. Why not give them the tools? Sorry. We argue that financial crises are uh, inevitable in any capitalist economy, specifically look at the business cycle. We're going to say that the Federal Reserve, um, the Federal Reserve being free from that could actually accelerate that, specifically the increase in interest rates um, leads to like, large capital investments in projects that have like, uh, specifically look at housing bubbles, for example. Large capital investments in the building of apartment buildings, um, uh, in the building of apartment buildings is indicative of like, um, overall inflation in that economic trend. Um, I want to move on to the, my, um, our third point specifically um, regarding how um, uh, Alex and Power Strong. So they've so far said that this is a non-political organization, but as the uh, lower house has pointed out in cross -X, specifically Congress is making this decision. Um, that, what, what we're talking about here is again, kind of a perceptual shift. The deregulation of the Federal Reserve reinforces the logic of neoliberalism, which is currently operating through a government logic. Neoliberalism is a kind of reduction in, um, is a reduction in uh, regulation. That reduction in regulation is ultimately going to be um, something that, when they wipe, uh, when we wipe away that regulation, that gets attributed to the Trump administration because most observers aren't paying attention to the particular um, dynamics within that government. It rather gets attributed to the government writ large. That means that the Trump administration is um, uh, is uh, and that means that the Trump administration is seen as basically kind of like there, it sets a precedent for them to be able to remove regulations and that room, uh, precedent for removal of regulation, as my partner pointed out, extends beyond a particular sector. It's kind of uh, it's kind of a form of path dependence, but a general philosophical path dependence specifically. Um, that general uh, that zeitgeist of deregulation leads to acceleration of Trump policies, specifically in regards to, uh, to the trade war. The acceleration of the trade war really can't be will uh, further um, impact out uh, lack of investor confidence, which is already destabilizing the economy. It means investors are really ready to like kind of run. That can like lead to worse economic uh, crises. That's why we're out to the most. I'd like to thank the deputy leader of opposition and invite every member of government to open up the bottom half. So it seems my old teammate Sam Erickson is trying to mold the West Coast debate circuit in his own image. First we get a sports round and then we get to talk about dual mandates in the Federal Reserve, and he puts up a nice little economic graph for us to look at. Here's going to be my extension. Very simple. The, re the mandate as it stands right now prevents the Federal Reserve from increasing inflation. The way that the Federal Reserve typically increases inflation is both by lowering interest rates, like um, like opening government told you, but more importantly, by buying back treasury bonds and by quantitatively easing banks. Here, here. We'd say that we want the Federal Reserve to be able to do that, even though it increases inflation, because it helps our economies in times of crisis. First, clarification slash deconstruction. Okay, let's talk about the Federal Reserve, because we kind of talked about it in the opening government, like how much power it doesn't have. The Federal Reserve does monetary policy. Its connection to the government is pretty sparse. The government can do two things. One, create con congressional mandates, what we're talking about today, and two, it can appoint the director of the Federal Reserve, that's about it. After the director is appointed, he has a term. Nobody can even see what's going on. That's why you hear like Republicans, somebody like audit the Fed or things like that. It's secret. He doesn't have any kind of accountability mechanisms. This is why people got really, really mad at Ben Bernanke, right? Here. I want to emphasize that this means that Trump's connection to anything the Federal Reserve is probably going to be like not really, it's not going to be seen as connected at most. Anyway, only Congress can remove this mandate. And so even if Trump looks like he was somewhat responsible for the mandate being removed, it's going to be something that was done across the aisles. I don't think it's going to support the Trump administration that much. Even if he can't accelerate policy, he only has a few more years left. Let's hope maybe six. That would suck. Anyway, <laughs> investor confidence. We think, responding to the second argument coming from the opening opposition, investors will probably be more confident in the Federal Reserve without a congressional mandate. Right now, there's the perception that the government is holding back the Federal Reserve, economic experts from making the best decisions for economies that they can, and that they're less likely to want to invest into an economy where people, like the people who are elected into Congress, which aren't seen as economic experts, are creating policies that regulate them. So therefore, we don't think the investor confidence stuff stands. What does the Federal Reserve do? Federal Reserve does monetary policy, which mostly falls under the confines of contractionary and expansionary policy, right? They expand and contract the economy in three ways. The first way is through interest rates. 
Note that what closing opposition said is right. Interest rates are better, uh, at, uh, better at fighting inflation, but not really good at creating inflation, right? You can raise interest rates, which means banks have to pay back more money when they take a loan from the Federal Reserve, which means more money gets taken out of the economy, which lowers inflation. But like closing opposition points out, when you lower an interest rate, that doesn't necessarily make inflation happen because you're not entering any money into the economy. How does the Federal Reserve actually make capital flow into the economy? Largely two ways. The first way is by buying back Federal Reserve bonds. So what the Federal Reserve does is it sells Federal Reserve bonds, that is it takes money from the people and sells them bonds. And then when it's ready to buy those bonds back, it gives money back to the people. What that means is they can take money out of the economy by, buying the, uh, by selling the bonds, and they can put money back into the economy by, buy, uh, by buying back those bonds. That's a way that they expand the economy. The third way is through quantitative easing, where the Federal Reserve quite literally goes into bank spreadsheets and adds zeros in order to give that bank more money. That's something that the Federal Reserve does. We're gonna say that expansionary policy is the main way for the Federal Reserve to fight unemployment. They can't fight unemployment any other way because they only have power over a monetary policy. What does that mean? The dual mandate basically is a contradiction for the Federal Reserve. Yeah. The only way they can fight unemployment is by putting more money into the economy, making people be able to get loans for lower interest rates, getting, being able to get money for their bonds, being able to get quantitative easing into banks so that they can give loans. Therefore, the dual mandate should be rejected simply on the fact that it's contradictory. That was the graph Sam, Sam showed you. The graph means that you can't do both. They kind of go against each other. What's the extension then? We're gonna say inflation's good. We're gonna say short-term inflation is especially good. We want the government, the Federal Reserve, to be able to use quantitative easing, and, uh, quantitative things like quantitative easing and buying back treasury bonds in times of economic crisis. Why can't they do it now? They can't do it now because the congressional mandate makes it so that they can't use expansionary policy because expansion in part, expansionary policy indeed creates short-term inflation. Okay, three scenarios of economic downturn where we want the Federal Reserve to be able to use expansionary policy but uh, where, where they can't do it now. Closing for quantitative easing is impossible, then what happened under Obama? Can you say that again? If you said quantitative easing is impossible, what happened under the Obama administration? So quantitative easing is still possible. All these things are possible because the Federal Reserve tries to maintain an interest uh, inflation rate of 2%. That's incredibly low. Here. They can only quantitatively ease insofar as they try to keep maintaining that interest rate. If they go much farther beyond that, then they're going against the mandate. The old member of opposition is shaking her head. Uh, you know, I'd like to hear about it. Perhaps I'm wrong, could be like higher than 2%. The mandate says, that, sure, it's higher than 2%. The mandate says that they can't do raise inflation that much. We want them to be able to raise inflation more than they do now. Okay, three scenarios. The first is times of massive economic downturn, which prevent people from paying back loans, right? So this is kind of like what happened in 2007. Right? So people get, have less money and they've taken out loans of credit and they can't pay back those loans because they're not getting any uh, sources of income. What happens when this, what, what, what happens, when this happens? Right? Banks have less money in their reserves because they expected to have pay, paying back of their loans and they no longer have that money. What happens as a result is that banks can't pay withdrawals. What happens when banks can't pay withdrawals? There's massive like, like madness for people going to the bank to try to get their money as quickly as possible before it runs out. This is the concept of a bank run. How does the Federal Reserve solve bank runs? Quantitatively easy, right? So if we take away the constriction that makes it so banks can't, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, can't raise inflation that much, we can let the Federal Reserve quantitatively ease all they want. We think in cases of severe economic downturn, this allows the Federal Reserve to put tons of money into these banks to allow them to pay withdrawals, right? Second scenario, domestic buyback of treasury bonds, right? So this is when the country experiences high unemployment or business failure, the, the, the uh, Federal Reserve can decide to buy back a ton of treasury bonds that investors have previously held, throw a ton of money into the economy for the short term and uh, give people, uh, and make sure that businesses can take out loans easier, make sure there's more capital for businesses to be able to reinvest in the economy, right? We're not saying trickle down economics always works, but when businesses have more money, the actual result is typically that unemployment least goes down a little bit and that businesses are able to operate better, right? But thirdly, we think it's even more important in cases of international crisis, right? right? Because international economies experience economic crises too. Why does the United States have an interest in this? Because they want to save international economies because they buy goods from those international economies, right? So they buy goods from places like Brazil, so they want those economies to be stable. How do they make them more stable? Recognize that international economies usually hold U.S. Treasury bonds as a response for goods, right? So the U.S. The US literally buys goods from these economies with Treasury bonds, right? So what can the Federal Reserve do? It can decide to buy back all of those treasury bonds from an international economy when they're in a time of economic crisis, flooding that country with capital, giving them foreign reserves to be able to buy things on the international market, right? What's the opposition response? Isn't inflation bad? Last thing I want to say in the extension. The US dollar is especially able to withstand inflation. Why? Because usually when a inflation becomes worse is when a, 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 a um, currency is no longer used to be able to buy goods at a significant rate, right? That creates something like hyperinflation. 
Recognize that the US dollar is used to buy and sell oil on international markets. Therefore, we believe it's significantly able to withstand that inflation and should be the torchbearer for helping monetary policy. I would like to thank the member of government and member of opposition to Oshina for bottom half of the opposition case here. here. Economics is the dismal science. It doesn't quite make the empirical cut that its natural science cousins afford. And I'm also going to try and spare you from lecturing an, an almost like an, an economics lecture for the, my seven minute speech and just really try and distill the essence of these topics, which I think can be understood in simplistic terms and not utilize that much jargon or economic theories. Uh, first of all, we have the uh, that empirically, like the Phillips curve doesn't actually run properly, and I'll explain that as simply as possible. Uh, second is that we think that the dual mandate is good, and it has been good. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Thirdly, we don't think that the European Central Bank, bank model would operate effectively in the US. Uh, and fifth, we're still confused as to, uh, we, we believe that there is confusion in the, in the front half of the debate, especially about who is going to be actually operating this change, and we think that's really important in, the, in when we connect this with Trump or with Congress. Okay, so first off, let's go with um, like we were presented this info slide with the Phillips curve, basically tells you you can't have uh, low inflation and low unemployment. That's not true. Like if you do the intro macro theory course and you get this really overpriced textbook by Gregory Mankiw or whatever your college uses, uh, it shows that that just isn't the case empirically in the long run. And it uses a bunch of countries that demonstrate that that neat curve that is like a theoretical construct actually doesn't come into practice. So what it tells us that's important from that piece of information is firstly that economics is kind of confusing, but also that you can have low inflation and you can have low unemployment and the economy still operates. Which move brings us to our second point, which is that if it's not broken, don't try and fix it. The dual man mandate has been good. It has been the status quo. We've had it for 50 years. No one has really been trying or even calling for it to be changed. No one, no one on side uh, government actually gave any sort of references evidence quotations of people saying that this is actually a limitation the reason why that they can't provide the evidence is because it doesn't exist so that's like another problem that they're going to be facing in this in this debate uh, we talked about like right now the u.s has very low unemployment uh, and this model aspires for zero percent unemployment but as side uh, opening opposition took from my poi uh, Zero, zero percent unemployment is never actually accomplished. It's something that you aspire towards in, in order to just make it extremely low. So it's not, it's not trying to say that we're actually ever gonna hit zero percent unemployment or that we're gonna hit zero percent inflation. That's just a misrepresentation. Yes, I'll take So it. the reason that the dual mandate hasn't tied up the Federal Reserve yet is because we haven't had an economic crisis on the scale of the Great Depression yet, right? But if we did, it would prevent the Federal Reserve from flooding the economy with capital like it would probably want to, to help with unemployment. Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, so what the, 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 the most confusing element of uh, closing government is, is that they're telling us that we don't have the means to, to use quantitative easing, which has been done under the Obama administration, and they try and weasel their way out of that. But the reality is, is that when the crisis came, money, money materialized, that issue just didn't come up. Uh, if it's not broke, don't try and fix it. Let's remember what happened with the gold standard. It was dropped under the Nixon administration in order to finance the Vietnam War, and so many economic issues and theories that we're coming up with, but this functionality of the modern economy now is arguably actually traced to this complete derailing of, of, of currency versus a physical gold standard that it was, that it was tied to. Now I'm gonna uh, move on to why a European-style central bank model wouldn't operate. If you remember the info slide, it said that the European model focuses on price stability, whereas the US, of course, focuses on both low inflation and low unemployment. The reason why the European model operates effectively is because, well, it doesn't actually operate super effectively all the time, but the reason why they take that approach is because they have something called automatic stabilizers, which basically means if someone becomes unemployed, which their model allows for more people to become unemployed under, they get higher rates of, of unemployment insurance, which then gives them more money to consume and re-kick the economy back into motion again. 
which in the US doesn't work because those kinds of social provisions are not as strong. So if you have high unemployment in the US, which is really what side government is saying is, it's okay with, you're gonna have a death spiral because those people who become unemployed don't get high unemployment insurance, don't ha therefore have money to consume and put back into the economy. And so all of those negative economic effects multiply and ramify themselves and balloon into a, uh, into a crisis, which they claim they're trying to avoid, but in, in actuality, they would actually generate. Uh, in order to demonstrate how this is true, why don't we just compare what the US unemployment rate is now? I believe it's somewhere around 3.5%. What is the average unemployment rate in Europe? It's between 10 and 15%. Uh, then my final, the final real issue that I have is that there's a confusion and an ambiguity that happens also on the front side of opposition and by government. If this is supposed to be an impartial organization, then why did opening government begin by discussing extensively the dynamics of Congress? And why was side opening opposition discussing extensively about the rhetorics of Trump? We understand that the Fed should operate independently and that its reliability is, is, is based on the fact that it acts independently because if it acts on the basis of political whims, then it will lose confidence because it doesn't therefore operate in the long run interest of the country, rather it reflects the short term interests of political parties that are fickle. I'll take your point, yeah. To say that the US has experienced low unemployment and low inflation is non-responsive to the extension. I told you why the Federal Reserve needs to be able to respond if there is a crisis, or perhaps if there is a crisis in an international economy, which has happened, and the Federal Reserve has been limited from being able to Well, I'll just use the counter example like I keep going back to is that you say that it's not possible, yet we had a financial crisis that happened in 2008 and 2009, quantitative easing was mobilized and actually put the US economy back on track. If you look at the European model with its own central bank policy, it had the euro crisis following the financial crisis four or five years later, which many countries still have not recovered and still do not have the same level of GDP that they had pre-crisis. Forget talking about growth, they've, they've lost like almost half a decade, a decade of economic activity. And this is really what like the how drives home the importance of this discussion, because so, uh, both front half and back half of government are proposing something that's incredibly risky, incredibly dangerous. They what they say it's preemptive to a problem which doesn't actually exist. If the pro if, if if we entered a crisis, why not just pass their regulation and, and and then do it then when we enter a crisis? Like why do we have to do this preemptive measure? We disrupt the entire status quo, and we know that the status quo is important because it gives investors confidence that there's stability. They give it, it gives them confidence that nothing is going to radically change suddenly. What they're proposing is a radical reshifting of the economy, which could in fact generate the kinds of problems that they're so concerned about. And for that reason specifically, we have to oppose. I'd like to thank the member of opposition and the government to close out the government case. You're here. You're here. fairly disingenuous to say that the only thing John gave you was a bunch of economic jargon that was inaccessible to the majority of this room. I think out of all debaters, and I think out of pretty, mu pretty much all of what's happening in most of the rooms uh, at this tournament right now, John does a pretty simplified explanation of very, very complicated and complex financial terms and the systematic ways in which monetary policy is mechanized by the Federal Reserve. John told you two specific things that I think are going to take the debate here. The first thing he told you is that the mandate that is provided by Congress to the Federal Reserve is mutually exclusive. Why is that? What it means here, and the important part that the, the extension speaker from the CO missed, was that what the, federal, the mandate means that the Federal Reserve cannot flood the market to businesses with capital to make sure they have enough money to do things like make investments, to make sure they can do things like make sure that they don't have to fire all of their employees, to make sure that they don't have to sell off all of their assets, which increases the risk that you balloon an already existing crisis and encourages people to panic. What unfortunately, the reason they can't do that is because by flooding the market, they increase inflation because the only way they could do that is increasing the market monetary supply, when you have too many goods chasing too many dollars, that increases inflation, which is bad for the economy, and contradicts the mandate, which the, uh, the mandate as a result of the mandate by Congress. That was what John was explaining. It is not sufficient to say that Obama used quantitative easing. It is not sufficient to say that in some instances, the contrary to what opening government and closing government have provided has happened. John told you that this is specific, specifically negative because it's economically illiterate in times where it needs to be exercised, flexibility needs to be exercised to save economies. What was the second thing he told you that was really important, right? This is not just important generally for economic, like in general economic trends, right? 
because there are instances where this can work, assuming the mandate wasn't assuming the mandate uh, uh, wasn't contradictory. What he told you, what John told you, was that in times of crisis, it's necessary for the Federal Reserve to exercise flexibility so that you can make sure that the economy doesn't tank. Why is that? Three reasons why. Right? He told you that you can't get back money from bonds that the government needs to sell, which means that you get that you can't pay the withdrawals from people taking out all their money because they've lost confidence in the Federal Reserve and the federal government. Even if that's not true, it's the perception that the government is taking in times of a crisis, which means they still pull out all their money. That's how you get things like bank runs. That's why you need quantitative easing to stop people from pulling out all the money. Or even if you don't stop them from doing that, you pay back the, the withdrawals if they do, which doesn't result in financial institutions quite literally collapsing. This is specifically what happened in 2008 and why we had to bail out so many corporations because once people freak out and panic during times of a crisis, everyone pulls out their money because all the banks lose their capital to pay back funds and investments that are making all across the world and all across like all across different sorts of economies, right? So what this basically means is that if you can't get back the money from the bonds, you increase the, the, the likelihood that a bank run is going to happen and exacerbate an economic crisis, simply put. Second of all, he told you that you needed, again, to float business capital to prevent failure. I sort of addressed a lot of this in why the mandate is mutually exclusive. But third and finally, it saves international economies by buying back treasury bonds and giving back foreign reserves to make sure that those economies don't take. Why is that? Because a lot of the businesses that are tied up in the United States economy rely on foreign reserves that exist across borders and across different markets and rely on those relationships to maintain themselves so that people in different countries don't freak out because capital is transnational, affects each other when everyone pulls it out all at once, which means that you exacerbate economic crisis if the, if the Federal Reserve cannot start, uh, cannot start buying back those treasury bonds. That means that the flexibility that is allowed for extenuating circumstances but rebuts, base, uh, rebuts basically everything that came from the CEO, right? They told you one in Paris, right? Okay, first of all, this is probably the minority of cases. Just because there are specific examples of cases where this has happened doesn't mean it is the broad trend or broad variety of cases that happened. You actually have to say them instead of saying that they exist. But even if that word wasn't true, John told you in a POI that was never adequately responded to that this is in most important in times of crisis, which is particularly why you need to preserve the ability for the Federal Reserve to exercise flexibility. Then we got that Obama used quantitative eating, be easy. Once again, you're just stating things that exist without engaging in the specific extension that was given by John, right? The problem was is that the, the ability for the Obama administration to exercise quantitative easing was limited by the fact that if they did too much of it, it would increase inflation, which was a contradiction of the mandate given by Congress in 1977. That was the point of the extension that was given by John. We think CO is out of this debate with the exception of some rebuffing and derivative material about the Trump administration exercising political influence. So let's move on to OO now that we've taken CO out and tell you why we're beating them too. So what, what do they tell you? They tell you that this is going to change the, the investor confidence that individuals have, which is going to result in like some sort of harms. I actually don't know why that is a, a bad thing. A couple reasons why that's probably not an issue. One, most people, as John told you, recognize the mandate as inefficient. You can say some economists support it, but the reason we're debating this is because it's a really bad policy and we just don't have the political capital to change it. That's why we're doing it. I think they're going to welcome the change because actually it's far more likely that they're going to be able to predict outcomes in the economy when the Federal Reserve can exercise rational choices during times of economic flexibility, which means they're far more likely to keep their capital in places instead of pull it out because they know what the Federal Reserve has to do, not what they will do, right? But also we think that the improvements that are going to be made in this policy, i.e. an instance where a crisis comes, hint there is a recession coming in the next 1 to 1.5 years as a result of the hyperinflated growth by things like Donald Trump's tax cuts and the extreme investor confidence that already exists in the sense quo. Once that happens and it conflicts and uh, uh, like joins together with the currency crises that are happening in places like, like Brazil and in places like Venezuela, this is going to be the specific time, which means you need to enact this policy now to prevent an economic crisis from spilling over and toppling on top of each other. Do I have a POI from anyone? Nope. Awesome. So, uh, we still think that's going to happen, and even if it does, it's going to be very short term because as soon as investors like are able to predict the choices that the Federal Reserve makes over a long period of time, because as you're right, the calculus changes, I think they're going to be just fine. They're going to figure out how it works, just as they did after 1977. So, then they tell you this is going to change the purpose of the Fed from growth to profit. They don't have anything to profit from, right? They don't have shareholders. They don't have a mechanism for keeping and accumulating capital. So I don't understand why that's going to happen. They said it's going to result in all these bad outcomes. Didn't tell you why. They just asserted it. Then last this whole idea that Trump is going to use the Federal Reserve to like like bolster his trade war with China. This is mostly derivative from CEO. Uh, also pulls some pieces from this. Doesn't really explain why it's true. 
First of all, Trump does not, the Federal Reserve does not have control over import and export markets. That's not how that works, which means he's probably not going to exercise his political rule over it. Second of all, this doesn't increase any more government power than already exists, because as John told you, Congress implemented the mandate, but they don't get to make decisions about monetary policy. They're made primarily in secret, which means the only political influence that is ever exerted on this body is one, the appointments of mandates, which we're getting, getting rid of on our side of the house, and two, the fact that the president appoints the chair of the Federal Reserve, which he doesn't care about because Donald Trump doesn't care about monetary policy because he probably doesn't understand it, which means he's probably not even going to notice this change once it even happens, which means he's probably not going to care about exerting his political influence. It literally would have to go over his head. Given the fact that we think that this is necessary, this is a necessary tool that the Federal Reserve needs to use during times of economic crises, both to save their own asses, but also to make sure that international crisis currencies don't destroy the world economy like it did in 2008, we base the propose. I'd like to thank Member or the Government Whip and invite up the opposition whip to close out round four of the Seattle IV figure. To close out today's debate, I'll be proving why opposition has won at the end of the day for three main reasons. Firstly, I'm going to be refuting government's points and how uh, opening government misunderstood both the motion and the American economy, and how the closing government provided empirics that supports dual mandate. Secondly, I'll be strengthening my own substantive arguments that my partner alluded to. Lastly, I'll be showing why closing government is the only side in today's debate that understands the inner workings of the U.S. economy, which is why we win today's debate. So first, let's move on to why um, opening government misunderstands three critical issues. First, they say that Congress is the one who's going to be revoking this dual mandate. However, Congress doesn't have this jurisdiction. The Fed is apolitical and not part of checks and balances, thus Congress can't actually take this action. Second of all, they said that the economy is becoming centralized and, quote, monopolies are less reliant on loans. First of all, big companies that they're talking about, such as Apple, Walmart, and Google, already have special interests on loans. So this motion is getting rid of dual mandate doesn't actually solve for this. So um, that point on their side fails. Lastly, they said how full employment is bad because it stagnates the economy. As multiple uh, people have referred to in this round, this is infeasible. This is actually impossible given the nature of the business cycles in America to simply fall into recession naturally. So this is infeasible. Secondly, the motion also says pursue full employment, not necessarily aiming for 0% employment. Thus, we conclude that open government simply fails to understand the motion and the American economy. Let's move on to opening opposition. They said their first point is that investment uh, confidence is important for stability. Now, we agree on closing Opposition. However, they didn't say why this is important at all, so I'm going to be going in my substantive arguments and saying how this um, is important for economic uh, progress. Secondly, they also made the misunderstanding about how Congress will wipe away the long-standing doctrine. Again, Congress does not have this jurisdiction. Lastly, let's move on to closing government. Now, they say how we need dual mandates in times of exigent economic crises, such as domestically and also internationals, international conflicts because of their investment in treasury bills. And we agree on side um, closing opposition. However, empirics have shown, given the great recession of 2008, the housing bubble crisis, and also the um, crisis that ensued in Europe following the financial crisis in 2010, are both empirics to show that the Fed recovered from this with their mechanism. Yes. Okay, so to be clear, the, go the Fed still has the ability to do expansionary policy, just not to the extent that they might want to. I would say that the 2000 financial, financial crisis was a disaster. I would say the Argentinian economic collapse was a disaster. They could have fixed that. They couldn't because of the yeah. All right, well, that, that doesn't take away from the fact that the whole reason why they were able to recover from these ex exigent circumstances was all due to dual mandates happening concurrently. Let's jump into why we have won to today's debate by reviewing our four substantive arguments that my partner has um, mentioned. First, the Phillips curve doesn't exist in the long run. We see how in the short run it may be the case that there's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. However, in the long run, we actually see the Phillips curve shifting in a bunch of weird ways that proves that this relationship does not exist when we look further into years of the economy. Second, dual mandate is good with um, full employment and low inflation. 
Let's talk about full employment first and why that's good. The workforce is being optimized, there's increased specialization, increased innovation, GDP is optimized, and that's the only way for the economy to grow in terms of um, raising the bar for maximum GDP and also maximizing employment rates. Economic growth leads to prosperity, which increases the incomes and wages of people of America, which increases our overall standard of living. And we'd say that economic prosperity is something we should uh, we should strive for. Thus, we agree that with this motion that uh, full employment is a good thing. Secondly, low in inflation is also good because it increases investment, which increases the incentive to innovate and to create. Third, US has weak um, automatic stabilization programs in comparison to Europe, so we should not be following their model at all. Um, for example, or some automatic stabilizers in America are Medicare, Medicaid, and unemployment insurance. Europe does not have these these types of programs. In fact, they have programs that are much stronger when you uh, get laid off from a job or something. So we can't really compare like the US's unemployment insurance policies that we implement when people get unemployed to Europe's policies when people get employed. So thus we cannot apply what they're doing to their central bank to our central bank. Again, um, my partner mentioned how um, in America, the unemployment rate rests between 3.5% to 4.5%, whereas in Europe, in the status quo, it's around 10 to 12% on average. Fourth, what's wrong with the status quo? Opening government talked about how in 1977, when dual mandate was first introduced, this is completely different from the economic climate of today, but they didn't state any detriments of the application of dual mandate to the current economy as it stands. So if it's outdated, why is it working? Yes. In the status quo, there hasn't been a large scale crisis since 1977. What if hypothetically a drought caused a disaster with the agricultural sector? How can, the, thank you. How can you say that there hasn't been a big economic crisis? The Great Recession of 2008 actually resulted in greater inflation rates and actually led to disinflation in the United States more than the Great Depression. And the Great Depression was still a larger scale economic crisis. But that's not to say that the Great Recession wasn't a big economic crisis. I don't know what you're talking about and the empirics show that dual mandate worked when this economic crisis hit America and when the European financial crisis hit um, all of Europe. So because we're the only side um, that shows you how opening government misunderstands the emotion and the American economy, and because we've shown you that the closing government fails to see that their empirics actually support the status quo, which is the dual mandate, and because we've shown you that Phillips curves is fake news and dual mandate is good, the European model doesn't work for America, the status quo is doing well, for all these reasons, judges, when you look down at your ballot, you will see a vote for the uh, closing opposition. Thank you. Here. I would like to thank you for the step outside, shake hands, make friends if you aren't already. Uh, we'll try to call you back in 15 minutes or less.